All right, all right. Good evening, everyone. I uh, bring you warm greetings from Canada. Uh, my name is Bruce McFarlane, and uh, I'm an American Board Certified Orthodontist who practices uh, in Canada. And I'm delighted that you're going to spend the next hour with me this evening. And I want to share with you some things that have been going on in the world of orthodontic acceleration and actually beyond acceleration. And uh, that's, we're going to get through some really uh, neat things t tonight that I'm hoping will ab absolutely help you in your day-to-day -day practice and some of the things that, uh, that as orthodontists, we run, we run into every day. So please fasten your seatbelts and uh, let's, uh, let's get into some interesting cases and uh, some new ideas in the world of uh, micro-osteoperforation and vibration. Um, I mentioned to you that I am... Uh, um, not uh, employed by any dental company and I don't own any stock or securities in any dental company nor do any of my family members and uh, I am indeed a uh, key opinion leader with Propel Orthodontics. I also speak uh, for Align Technology and also for Henry Schein Orthodontics as well. So those are all of the disclaimers and disclosures for you. Uh, the other thing about tonight, a lot of the ideas that I'm going to present to you aren't necessarily those of Propel Orthodontics, and I want to make that clear uh, right off the bat. Uh, some of the things uh, I, I have been uh, doing with the system uh, haven't been exactly um, uh, um, on label with, with Propel. And so uh, first, first off, I want to make sure that you're clear that some of these are my ideas, but I, but I honestly do think they are showing some real promise in my practice. Uh, I now have two offices in Canada. Uh, I'm actually right here right now. This is uh, Winnipeg, Canada, and uh, I do have a second office also in uh, Thunder Bay, Ontario, and I go there once a month. And my office in Thunder Bay, Ontario is strictly Invisalign. So actually every case that comes into that office is an Invisalign case. And um, I credit being empowered to do that uh, sort of thing to my mentor, Dr. Donna Galante, and, uh, amongst others. And I'm just uh, so, so thrilled to, uh, to be able to look at every single case as an Invisalign case these days. Uh, this is my office in Winnipeg. Those are Brucey's Angels, we call them. And um, I have a traditional office in Winnipeg with the um, with the 11 chairs and the uh, uh, 90 patients a day and, and chasing my tail. And uh, in Thunder Bay, I have a much less traditional office, uh, two chairs, uh, one reception room uh, a hygienist owner who is an independent dental hygienist, and she's my landlord and host. And um, I have one other hygienist that works there and also a dental assistant. And so it's kind of a unique model. It's a lot less overhead, for one thing. And um, stay tuned. We'll, uh, we'll let you know how this, um, how this model works out. But so far, it's looking very promising. And um, as you know, clear aligners require a lot less uh, things like inventory and instruments and also uh, team members as well. So I'm uh, kind of excited about this going forward. Um, those of you who, uh, this is when I'm not in one place, I can be in the other. Uh, this is my cutout. I have two carry-ons as well, so um, it's nice to, uh, to be everywhere at once and uh, be working the room no matter whether I'm there or not. Uh, those of you that are following my social life know that I'm in a long-term relationship with, uh, with my car. Uh, this is Tess, and uh, I'm... Uh, can honestly say that my love for her grows every every single day, um, and Tess and I are, are getting along super well these days. Um, she wasn't too too happy with me tonight um, because we had uh, 30 centimeters of snow in Winnipeg. Uh, but she's all-wheel drive and uh, no worries about starting because she doesn't really start in the traditional sense. She just uh, goes. So uh, continue my love affair with with Tess. So um, the, one of the messages I want to start with today is that uh, we're really getting kind of mainstream with orthodontic acceleration. Uh, and in my office, it's, uh, it's really top of the mind when um, anyone comes in and says, you know, I've got this deadline. I'm getting married in uh, six months. I, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time in orthodontic treatment. 
asked, what can you do for me? And uh, the answer is, um, absolutely, we have some tools now that can really uh, help accelerate their orthodontic experience. And uh, one little tip that I have is that uh, I don't always introduce the concept right off the bat. The day we do our initial consultation, there's so much information for patients. And uh, we're giving them sort of the hows, the how, the how matches, and, and all those sorts of things. And um, so quite often we actually hold back a little bit on this uh, arrow that we have in our quiver, and which is orthodontic acceleration. And uh, quite often with an adult or an older adolescent, they'll get early into orthodontic treatment and give you one of those, oh gosh, is there any way that we can speed this up? This is already driving me crazy. And we go, ah, you know, by the way, there is actually. And here it is. It's called microosteoperforation. Oh, and wouldn't you know it, there's an actual uh, code in our fee guide for it. And uh, I think we can get you some coverage for it. And the research suggests that this is going to actually increase the rate of your tooth movement. Um, by by a considerable amount, and as you know, the research is showing about two uh, two times the um, the traditional rate for for tooth movement. Um, and now um, we're also introducing um, high frequency vibration as well, and it looks like the the two are going to be synergistic with each other, and um, and it's exciting that um, that we are uh, really maximizing. Um, what nature is able to give us as far as the rate of tooth movement goes. And uh, when it comes to microosteoperforation, this is where it's at. We actually cause a small injury in the bone, and this causes a, a cellular cascade. Uh, the cytokines are recruited to the area, like as happens with all forms of inflammation in our body. and uh, Sure enough, they call to the scene um, our favorite cells like osteoblasts and osteoclasts, and uh, that increases the amount of bone remodeling and decreases bone density temporarily to move the teeth in the, in the directions that we want them to move uh, at a much faster rate. Uh, generally, the effect kicks in after about 24 hours and will remain uh, in force for about uh, 12 weeks altogether. The other interesting thing that we found is there's a rather good-sized halo of effect of the microosteoperforation, and we're seeing it effective out into about 8 millimeters beyond where the initial um, osteoperforation occurred, and it's in three dimensions. So it actually goes uh, buccal to lingual as well as mesial to distal. Um, away from where the initial uh, um, hit was. And so we're finding that we have to make less number of perforations than we originally thought. And we're also having to do it less often than we originally thought. And by we, I'm, I'm talking about the key opinion leaders uh, who have been working with this system uh, since 2013. Uh, the devices that we deliver these, this with, uh, I would say now the, the vast majority of us are using the, uh, the disposable tip device. Um, the neat thing about that is the, the handle itself is actually autoclavable and therefore only the tip is single use. And there's two types of tips. One is uh, an open tip. Uh, one is a closed tip. I kind of like the closed tip myself because it gives me a little uh, target in the mucosa. And also, uh, as you are turning, the, the self-tapping uh, screw mechanism, um, you can actually tell how far you're going because as this blue plastic hits the line, then uh, we know we're at, uh, uh, at the, the correct graduations of 3, 5, and 7 millimeters. Um, some of the questions, uh, then of course the tip is, is disposed of as a sharp and, um, and the handle is, is uh, autoclave for the next time. Um, some of the questions I get is, you know, how, how do you know how deep you're going to, you have to go? And especially with the uh, manual handle, we're actually getting a really good sort of tactile sensitivity um, from the handle and you can tell 
when you're, first of all, through the mucosa and through the periosteum, you'll hit the, a fairly uh, resistant area, and that, of course, is the cortical bone. And, uh, and then, uh, most areas that the cortical bone is rather thin, and as you work your way through the cortical bones by, by continuing to turn the device in a clockwise rotation, you'll actually feel it give a little bit, and that's a sign that you're into the cancellous bone. And we honestly don't have to go that far into the cancellous bone. If we're a good millimeter to two millimeters into the cancellous bone, then we are where we want to be as far as creating this little uh, mini injury that causes the, um, the cascade that we're after. And then we just back it out. Um, the devices are, the actual tips are not reusable, but the handle is. And um, I'm hoping that that will help you. Um, of course, at different areas of the mouth, that means different uh, depths. Um, in the upper anterior, for instance, we find that just pretty well to the three uh, millimeter line, you're, you're where you want to be. Um, I would say back in the mandible, uh, maybe way back by, by second molars, you may want to go into about seven millimeters. And once again, you'll feel it. but um, that there's going to be more necessity to go to go deeper. Uh, lower anteriors, we're finding that uh, we used to do a lot of sort of uh, a pattern of these microosteo perforations in uh, in a vertical um, sense, and we're finding that only one now is necessary between each of the roots of the lower anteriors. I'll usually use two, about two millimeters apart, in the upper anterior and in the uh, premolars. And generally, we've been finding that that gives us what we want. Uh, another question comes up, what if I want it right in the middle and there's a big old frenum or something in the way? We do know that if we're on the distal of the roots of the central incisors, uh, that, that halo of influence will go um, well beyond the uh, mesial aspect of the root of the central incisors. So it's not like you have to go right into the frenum or anything like that. That could be troublesome. Um, so. Uh, you're great, just distal to the uh, to the centrals. We'll also go distal to the laterals, and um, and then distal to the canine roots as well. Uh, some other cool things about microosteo perforation: we can actually get where it counts. And I, and uh, later on in this presentation, I'm going to share with you uh, how we're doing, making things happen that maybe otherwise may not be happening. And I think the key is we're able to get to a very important part of the tooth, and that is, of course, the center of resistance of the tooth, which is usually about two-thirds of the root, two-thirds of the way apically up the root. So um, no other um, sort of effect can, ha can, or no other acceleration technique can actually get in to, uh, to where, that, where it really counts, except perhaps, of course, a, a corticotomy, which is much, much more invasive. Um, and so it's exciting that we can actually get up where it really, really counts with these teeth, and especially if we're trying to create bodily movement or, or a more difficult movement. Uh, it's nice to have access to that area with our influence from the uh, microosteoperforation. Um, so the, uh, the way that we go about it is um, we have a good look around the area. You'd, one does want to avoid things like uh, the mental foramen, uh, also, um, of course, roots of teeth, you really want to avoid them. So we have our, uh, our, our digital x-rays up and, and um, when, we're, when we're doing the microosteoperforations. Um, we have our patients rinse with uh, chlorhexidine two times for one minute each, and, uh, and then they spit it out, and then we go ahead and anesthetize them. I'm actually a proponent of a little bit of local, actual, an injection of local anesthetic, um, just because I find it's a little more profound. But uh, lots of my colleagues are, are using um, a, a good topical as well. And you can ask your Propel rep for an, um, some advice on that. But uh, generally, we'll put a little uh, topical of our own and then, uh, and then actually infiltrate the area. I find the patients much more comfortable uh, with that. And I feel more comfortable too. Um, and generally, we're we're wanting to get into the bone at about uh, two millimeters, and that's into the cancellous bone. And now, of course, we have the accelerator, which is a uh, 
a handpiece driver specifically for micro osteoperforation and uh, the, this is neat because now the uh, the only non-reusable part is the actual burr and uh, this device has uh, forward and reverse for going clockwise and counterclockwise as we put the, uh, the perforations in. It also um, is governed by the R RPM and that's an important thing one really doesn't want to go too fast with this because an enemy of uh, of actually um, moving teeth, of course, is is bone necrosis. So the last thing you want to do is go too fast and then actually cause um, necrosis of the bone. So that's why this device is specifically governed to a maximum of 45 uh, rotations per minute. So a uh, neat device, and uh, we'll usually use it along with our assistants. Uh, who will, we're just kind of aiming the device and putting it where we want it and then they're operating the forward and reverse button for us and uh, it's a lot easier on your hands if you're uh, you know, doing lots of these per day. Um, the handheld device does get a little bit uh, tiring to your hand. So uh, kind of neat that that device is out there and um, uh, it's rechargeable and the uh, the burr is the, is the part that is uh, disposable as a sharp, and the rest of the device is sterilizable. Um, micro osteoperforation is useful uh, in pretty well all aspects of orthodontics, uh, be it unraveling crowding, closing space, molar upright,ing etc. Um, and uh, it's used with all aspects of orthodontics, including braces and with uh, clear aligners as well. And it's showing some really neat uh, promise for those patients, and you know exactly who they are. Uh, the bride to be, who has to have this done by her uh, by her June wedding, the uh, the CEO who who simply can't be wearing aligners for for uh, that long, <laughs> and uh, and other individuals that uh, for whatever reason you may actually want to uh, have them go through the procedure in your office more rapidly. <laughs> so uh, sometimes we do it proactively as in we know in advance that we actually are going to use micro osteoperforation and therefore we'll premeditate it and we will charge for it and let the patient know in advance that it's coming. Uh, and sometimes it's reactive as in we get into a, a bind or we get behind time-wise and we want to move this along. Um, then we pull out the uh, micro osteoperforation and away we go. So this is all pretty routine now in my office, both for braces and for clear aligners, that we're using this for micro, uh, pardon me, that we're using this for uh, orthodontic acceleration. For instance, uh, this patient, uh, I thought that uh, these teeth were going to be tough. This is an adult, deep bite, um, you know the type, uh, worn teeth, been there a long time, and um, and you just know that those are going to be tough teeth to move. So I thought that it would take to unravel those incisors a good five months with even my best sort of, you know, um, heat-treated nickel titanium wires and, uh, or heat-activated wires and that sort of thing. Uh, and sure enough, we got this in, uh, in two months. So that you can see the micro perforations. They're in a vertical uh, column, about two millimeters apart between each of the lower incisors. Uh, we find even like a day after it's done, these little blemishes are gone, but we know that the effect remains for about 12 weeks. And uh, we got that in two months, and that was one of the things that made me a believer. In this particular case, I did my own sort of split mouth study because I didn't uh, perforate these teeth, and they didn't move hardly at all. Um, and uh, so now, days, I would look around at all of the teeth, all of the tough ones and the rotations, and pretty well perforate them all while I'm at it and uh, really make this happen. So from there to there in two months, and that was one of the original cases that made me kind of a, a believer in uh, micro osteoperforation. Also pretty routine with aligners. This is a case uh, that was done, you know, we thought probably with the number of aligners and at the time we were using two-week intervals that uh, probably it would take a good two years and, and maybe even would take some extractions and possibly and a bunch of case refinements as well. But sure enough, in uh, ten and a half months and three uh, micro osteoperforations, um, this case 
uh, finished up nicely. So uh, saving of five months, um, saving of four chair appointments, uh, don't have to tell you what that means for uh, patient satisfaction and, um, and also for your own uh, economic well-being as well. Ah, so from there to there, in ten and a half months, and this was another one of the early cases that uh, that caught my eye when I was thinking about um, about microosteoperforation and uh, acceleration. And now we have added uh, vibration to the mix, and uh, this particular version of vibration is uh, high frequency, and uh, it's a little different from some of the other vibration possibilities that are out there in that it is only required to be to be used for five minutes a day. We usually tell our patients uh, after supper, uh, after you brush your teeth and um, pop your liners back in, go ahead and, and uh, just gently bite on this device. And it's, uh, it's timed as well. It'll give them five minutes of vibration. And it's uh, showing some real promise as an aligner seeder. And um, it's kind of like the ultimate chewy. We use a lot of chewies in our office, but uh, this is this is way better. Um, and we're seeing the, that the aligners really seat nicely and uh, are much more effective because of that. Cost of the patient is approximately 400 per device, which is less expensive than some other devices that are out there. We do rely a little bit on patient compliance. However, we find that five minutes a day isn't too much to ask. Uh, other things that I'm seeing with it, and these are my observations, not uh, not Propel's uh, findings, and that is not only are we seeding clear aligners, we're unbinding arch wires. So I use it a little bit off-label with um, with braces, and I'm finding that the patients, uh, we, we are getting a little bit uh, more efficient tooth movement out of our braces, um, and I think the reason is we're actually on any areas that are binding uh, between bracket and wire, we're actually loosening with the vibration, and that is is giving me more uh, uh, more e efficient tooth movement. Uh, and uh, honestly, I, it hasn't been proven, but I do believe we're going to see some acceleration with this device, possibly synergistically with uh, microosteoperforation. And my patients report that uh, it actually makes them more comfortable, especially the night after a, a braces adjustment or a new set of aligners. They are, uh, with the vibration, they actually seem to feel a little bit better. So once again, not necessarily uh, things that Propel uh, is, is telling you that they're effective for. Um, the, uh, Propel has been able to state that they are indeed efficient clear aligner seeders, but uh, we're going to see some of these other things um, are going to be, um, they're going to prove out that, that what I'm seeing in my office is, is also um, is true as well. Um, so it comes with a little mouthpiece, an oscillator, a little flash drive so that we can actually um, monitor our patient's use of it, and a wall adapter and a charging cable. So basically we have our patients uh, take it out of the package and clean the mouthpiece. Uh, we actually charge them in our office prior to so that we can demonstrate them to the patient right away in the office. And, uh, and then the, the uh, Patient is good to go. We connect the mouthpiece to the vibration device, and uh, they they uh, press on a little white switch, and that starts the vibration unit, and the gen the, it gently ramps up to full vibration, uh, and it'll work for five minutes, and then it automatically shuts off, and um, they'll be they'll know that it's done because it starts vibrating, and also they'll see a little uh, green blinking light. So we just clean it and charge it for the next day as well. And so far, really nice feedback from our patients on uh, the use of the uh, vibration device. Uh, we can also watch what, what they've, uh, what kind of uh, usage they've been getting, and uh, it helps us to to know that uh, you know how consistent they're being with with this. So there is what it looks like, and uh, we find that that it allows the uh, aligners to track really nice and of course we judge that carefully especially around the attachments and uh, how the subsequent aligners are, are pretty close to almost fitting again we, we know that, uh, that the previous aligners are, are fitting well uh, and it allowed us to jump the gun a fair bit on the uh, Alliance um, recommendation that we go to one week intervals 
and uh, some of us, especially in the uh, key opinion group, are down to five week, f pardon me, five day intervals, and some even three day intervals with our aligners. Um, I, I kind of like one week because it's kind of easy, like you know, change your aligners on Sunday. Um, but uh, there, there is that possibility where we can go even shorter intervals with our clear aligners and vibration technology. So here's a case. Um, Dr. Brigham uh, submitted this one seven months with one week intervals, uh, 24 total aligners, and uh, you got some nice space closure and uh, nice detailing um, in seven months. And, and I think that that is a really neat, um, compelling reason to consider using vibration uh, with or without uh, micro osteoperforation. Okay, so that's great. Um, in my friend Jonathan Nicosius's uh, words, we're doing that all day, every day. But how about, um, is there anything else that we can do with micro osteoperforation and vibration? And uh, once again, it is absolutely my duty to let you know these are not Propel's ideas. Uh, these are things that almost by accident that I've discovered in my office and I uh, will be encouraging the research team to look into, but uh, so far these are my anecdotal observations, but um, they're kind of neat. Uh, and I love some of these things. Uh, the difficult we do immediately, the impossible just takes a little longer. So some of the cases you're going to see here aren't exactly fast, but the um, Propel has actually made these cases possible. So um, that's how we frame it with our patients. And of course, a lot of these are reactive because I don't know in advance that I'm going to run into tr these sorts of troubles, but I do know what I have in my back pocket to help me. And, uh, and so I've learned a lot more <laughs> from the, uh, you know, you don't learn a whole lot from the case that absolutely goes from zero to 34 aligners and you take them off and hand them retainers and, and uh, you know, uh, those, those are the cases that are great, of course, but um, we don't learn much from them. How about the ones where you're actually in a, literally in a bind and uh, you need a way out? And that's the way we kind of frame it with our patients as well. You know, obviously, uh, some of these things that I'm doing with the devices are not, um, you know, absolutely on-label type type activities, but the way that I'll say to them, it, I'll frame it with them, and it's important that it's in, that, that be included in the uh, in the informed consent. Um, you know, this tooth, this tooth is not moving. Uh, there are some options here. Uh, we can do a segmental osteotomy. We can do a luxation, or we can give up and we can extract the tooth. And so given, given those options, and then they say, Doc, is there anything else? That, and we go, well, you know, it isn't uh, a, an action that this device is, um, is totally uh, made for. However, I have been seeing some really neat things uh, with the, uh, the impossible tooth movements. So the next few cases I'm going to show you, they aren't pretty, and uh, they're not exactly what we started out. Uh, doing with with uh, Propel, but they are encouraging, and I want you to have a look and open your mind, and um, and give it give it some thought, um, and and please be assured that we're researching this, and and I think it'll be a really neat break breakthrough, if some of these things can become uh, predictable with especially with micro osteoperforation. So here we go. Um, it's of course widely accepted and and mainstream now. Um, and so now um, my, my brain, of course, turns to using micro osteoperforation and vibration to get us out of those tough binds. And once again, my idea is not, not those of uh, Propel Orthodontics. Okay, here's Taylor, 15-year-old, uh, three-month uh, patient, young lady, and uh, we do a lot of stuck canines. <laughs> I don't know what it is. It's just, well, I think for one thing, a lot of general dentists do the uh, do orthodontics where I'm from, and uh, they absolutely cherry pick the easy cases. So I'm not getting the you know the cute little class ones with a bit of crowding. I'm getting the the tougher ones. 
Uh, but here's Taylor, terrific young lady, um, bit of a oral hygiene challenge which we've, we've been trying to address all the way along. Uh, class one deep bite and sure enough uh, she's got a pretty impacted upper right canine. So uh, in her case I'm going to use some braces and uh, we're going to open up some space. So our usual protocol is braces for about six months. We use uh, open coil and we open up space that, you know, as you saw from the previous slide, the uh, deciduous tooth had already been removed, uh, um, but the panel shows it here. And then we actually go in and have a closed um, exposure done. And we work with our surgeon, um, under, usually under intravenous sedation, he'll go in and uh, open up into the palate and he'll uh, find these teeth. He'll bond an eruption chain to the, to the tooth. He'll let the chain hang out of the, uh, of the mucosa and then he'll stitch it right back. So what we have is, is a chain hanging out of, uh, of the mucosa and then he sends them over and we activate the chain with, uh, with a, some open coil spring on our arch wires. Okay, so sure, these are long cases, of course, and uh, so we got out to about 16 months, and I'm in trouble. And what happened is uh, the canine uh, was down, but it was getting stuck. And of course, uh, those of you that have been at this game a uh, while well, have seen this. And basically what it is is the uh, one tooth isn't moving and of course it's acting almost like its own little TAD and uh, raising all the other boats. So we, uh, I go to my, Taylor's mom and dad, look, you know, um, we could have the surgeon go in again, we could have him freeze her up and, we, and he'll turn it almost like he's going to extract it and bring it down or he'll take the bone and, and cut it and reposition it and plate it. However, you know, gosh, we've been having some interesting findings with this uh, less invasive procedure where we actually put some little dimples in the bone around the roots of these teeth and uh, wouldn't you know it, we've been seeing that that seems to free them up and the parents go, yep, gosh, you know, if we can save another trip to that darn surgeon or uh, that other thing just sounds awful. Let, let's give it a go. So we have them sign the informed consent that, by the way, this is not, you know, sort of a, um, an on-label procedure, but we think that it's uh, based on our, on our experience, that it's worthwhile. And uh, the other side of it is there's not that many things that can go wrong. I think the worst thing that could happen is just nothing will happen. And so uh, we go in and you can see the micro perforations. Uh, we're doing them around the canine. Usually uh, I'll do two on either side of the canine. I also did them um, around the uh, premolar teeth as well. And then uh, this is a braided uh, uh, stainless steel wire versus a, a 1925 stainless steel wire on the bottom. And then we hit them with the elastic. Sometimes we use the box style of elastics and then we also have them run a little uh, N type elastic at night. So we use a, a little longer um, medium strength elastic and they wear it like an end, sort of canine, lower first premolar, upper first premolar, lower second premolar. So four weeks after we did them up, I'm, sh uh, I'm getting some uh, results. And so I'm encouraged and mom and dad are like, oh my goodness, we're thrilled. Uh, it became clear to me that probably the lateral incisor was involved as well. So we actually put a little Kobe hook on the, on the lateral and extended our little box elastic up to the uh, to the lateral also and we got out to four months and we still weren't getting exactly where we want to go and we know that the effect of the uh, MOP is about three months so uh, we we said look you know I'm encouraged by by what I see here the teeth have actually moved which is a really positive thing and uh, would you mind if I gave Taylor another little drop of freezing and we and we uh, perforated her once again. Mom and dad already were, uh, were on board and they said, yep, let's go ahead. So I actually moved the microsteal perforation a little more mesially so you can see we're involving the lateral incisor as well as the canine and the first premolars here. And two months after that, boom, teeth are down. So um, I was, uh, this is one of the first that I did 
uh, purposefully not just for acceleration, but actually to try and do something that was pretty well, uh, in my in my experience, impossible, uh, and get it going. So, um, what happened here? Of course, we're gonna we're gonna do some research on this and uh, and actually figure it out on a cellular level. But my own sort of view is that uh, those teeth are parts of the root are actually ankylosed. Uh, it has to be like they're 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 just stuck, and um, the the micro osteoperforation, especially I talked earlier on how we can get it up where it really counts, and that is way up high towards the apex of the of the tooth, and for some reason the activation of the, the, of the inflammation and the cellular activity seems to be able to overcome some minor ankylosis. So that is so encouraging to me and so exciting uh, because of the other alternatives that are, that are available to us with a tooth that just won't move. So then I started to think about other possible situations. And here's one, uh, Wendy, a very dear lady, and uh, She's come in, she's 55 and a half, she's done everything for her children. Uh, they've all had been through orthodontics and she goes, it's my turn. And you know what, for the past 48 years, my teeth on the right side have never touched each other. And I'm going, wow, Wendy, that is really, really something. Of course, earlier in my career, uh, it's pretty well, very little question that I would say to Wendy, you got to go meet the surgeon, let's go talk to him about uh, the differential Lafort um, osteotomy and uh, we'll see if we can get those teeth uh, to fit. She didn't want surgery. Um, this is her conclusion, honestly. So you can see here she's in absolute maximal intercuspation on the left side up to about the canine, and then beyond there, that's daylight. <laughs> and uh, I doubt those were abfractions because those teeth have never touched each other. So uh, here we go. Wendy, uh, I'd like you to look at this consent form. Um, this is uh, microosteoperforation. I can't look you in the eye and say absolutely that it's going to work nor is there a whole lot of uh, solid research behind it just yet. But um, I've had some experience with it now and it would save uh, jaw surgery for you. What do you say? And uh, almost all patients that I know um, will go, Doc, you know, if there's something that can avoid them doing that awful surgery that I watched on YouTube, let's give it a go. I get it. You know, you can't look me in the eye and say that it's going to work, but um, let, let's, uh, let's, let's go ahead. So we went ahead. Um, she, you can see that she has a couple of bridges as well, so we know uh, we're not going to be too successful in moving them. Uh, there was one replacing um, a molar down here and one replacing a lateral incisor here and a lateral incisor over here as well. So these are the teeth that we suspect uh, never really uh, came down. And uh, so we're going to go ahead and actually micro osteoperforate in these areas and then follow up with some elastics and let's see if we can get uh, these teeth that have never actually erupted to erupt. Six months embraces, uh, we got the initial alignment. You can see there's a 1925 nitai wire on the bottom and on top we're in my 2125 braided wire which is, is a, a typical wire that, that we use when we're trying to get vertical settling. And we go ahead with the elastics and we hit her with the micro osteoperforations. And you can see the little dimples all the way along from the, uh, from the uh, distal of the upper right first molar uh, all the way around to the canine here. And we said, okay, work hard with your elastics, please, Wendy. Let's see what we can do. Four weeks. Ah, okay, so she came in, and of course in the transverse, we're not that great. Um, of course, she's got some width, width issues, but the vertical um, actual emergence of those teeth on top uh, really, really caught my eye, and that is absolutely exactly almost to the day four weeks later. 
So let's keep going. Um, and here we are 12 weeks post-MOP and uh, we've got uh, some actual occlusion on the right side and uh, you got to know Wendy is just like, you can't believe it for one thing and also um, just so thrilled that we've actually been able to balance her occlusion. So at 12 weeks, um, this, this case is, is absolutely still in progress. Uh, we're going to mop her again and uh, see now if we can get some, some more settling. So we're most encouraged by this. And we're not seeing any untoward uh, periodontal problems or nastiness. So uh, that's, uh, that's pretty exciting to me as well. She's pretty well the same. Uh, Recession-wise, of course, we have the periodontist working with us as well in this case. But uh, from there to there in 12 weeks, for someone who's never had teeth touching, uh, that is cool. So um, another neat uh, little result that has caused me to be encouraged about this possibility for microosteoperforation. Uh, Matthew, 23-year-old 23, 23 um, young guy, and uh, he's come to me for some orthodontics. And you know, sometimes you don't really know in advance what's going to give you trouble. Uh, it looks like a fairly innocent case, you know, whatever, the upper right canine is probably a little blocked, and we're just going to expand him a bit. And uh, we're going to put a bracket on that canine and just drop it down. He's a little class two on that side. We're going to work on that. Uh, not too big a deal. Um, sure, let's derotate that molar. We'll distalize on that side and, uh, and guide things down. Sure enough, uh, we get moving along here uh, with Matthew. And six months in, wouldn't you know it, that canine just is not moving at all. So now I'm getting kind of... Uh, good at this and, and feeling more comfortable about using MOPS to help me along and, uh, and also a little bit uh, cranky and, and impatient when these, these sorts of things happen. So um, I pull out the uh, Propel device much more quickly these days and say, hey Matthew, yep, can't say to you for sure that this will work, but uh, we've, shown, we've been showing some really neat results with this. Uh, let's give it uh, a month and we'll come back, we'll take another picture and what's going to happen. Uh, boom, the canine is down. Of course, it's still in class two, but uh, with the microosteoperforation and Matthew's good elastic wear, uh, we managed to get from there uh, to there in one month. That too uh, caught my eye and caused me uh, to think some more about some more applications of microosteoperforation in these really tough cases. Uh, so Manny comes along. Uh, we do a lot of lingual in our in our practice, and in many of them are combinations, as in lingual upper and um, and labial on the lower. And nothing drives me more crazy than when the lingual uh, side, the, the lingual buckle segments start to buckle on me. So here's Manny. You know, it doesn't look too bad. Deep bite. He's got a central diastema. He'd rather not show his braces, so we say, yep, Manny, let's go ahead and um, um, do a lingual on the top. We're going to do some labial braces on the lower. That E isn't long for the wor for this world, so let's actually uh, extract it, and we'll close the space. We're going to need a little TAD to do that, so uh, we're going to put that down here, and we'll move everything forward to overcome Isaac Newton's third law of motion on that side. So uh, this tooth, we're going to extract it. We're going to move everything forward. And we're going to use uh, lingual braces on the top, and away we go. So six months later, uh, we do our little x-ray with our target for the TAD. I'm a lousy shot with this, as you can see, but smart enough to put the TAD on the mesial of the target rather than in the middle of the target. So uh, we managed to get our little TAD in there, and away we go with our space closure. Uh, and everything's fine, uh, going well. And now we're 17 months, that's from nine months later, uh, or pardon me, 11 months later, uh-oh, we're starting to buckle on top. And my TAD is failing as well. Not too big a deal with the TAD failure. We'll either stop using it or we'll move it more uh, apically and into a better position. But the big issue is those teeth on the upper are buckling on me. And uh, I just don't have a great explanation. We're in a really strong lingual wire. I think it was 1622, and uh, these teeth are actually coming forward nicely, so that should be coming out of the wedge. Uh, those teeth should be settling in just like like uh, nobody's business. So I went, Manny, you know, those teeth are not uh, not supposed to do that. Um, 
we have a solution that uh, might may be a good possibility for you here. Let me put some buttons on the outside of these teeth, and uh, and I want to use my cross tooth perforation. So we go ahead and perforate him uh, around the molars and the first and second premolars, and then we start with the um, with the elastics. And you can see here we're closing space with a 19M closing spring, and I've I've uh, stopped using the TAD on that side. One month uh, starting to come down. And uh, Manny was a little oral hygiene challenged as well here, but uh, it's starting to come down nicely, and I'm encouraged. And then uh, in two months, uh, we've almost got them back down to, uh, to the occlusal plane that we want. So uh, in three months, uh, even a little closer. Now part of it, of course, you, you'll notice is these teeth coming forward and kind of out of the wedge, but we're also getting uh, some leveling of his uh, occlusal plane as well. So from there to there, in three months, uh, I was very happy to have uh, microosteo perforation in my little kit to, uh, to help me out. And I'm not exactly sure what I would have done uh, without it in this case. Probably just keep struggling or uh, talk to the surgeon about some luxations. Uh, so we got two more cases. This is Ivan, uh, just the sweetest little kid. Uh, and I met him at 10 years, four months. and uh, he had uh, something up with Ivan's uh, upper right central incisor, and that's that's an understatement because there's really something up with Ivan's upper right central incisor. In fact, it's pointing up, and uh, you can see that it also has a pretty large dilaceration in its root. If you follow its um, its little uh, outline here, so we go in and. Uh, we uh, here it, here it is. Pardon me on the steps. You can see uh, that Ivan's um, that's the incisal uh, edge of his upper central incisor, and um, sure enough, uh, we'd like it down here somewhere. So uh, away we go, and we know we'd say to Ivan's mom and dad, "This is going to be a long one, um, but let's get him a central incisor. It's become my my life's quest here." So 32 months, we got a two by four in there, and uh, we had the tooth exposed, we brought it down, and do you think that I could labial root torque this tooth? Uh, no, I, I simply could not. Um, part of it is, you know, that, that uh, there wasn't quite enough space, and of course you saw the dilaceration of that root as well. Uh, also, <laughs> it doesn't help that the uh, the lateral incisor was encroaching on its on its area as well, but you can actually see the dilacerated root there. So we decided um, with Ivan, he was kind of getting tired of me, and I wanted to wait for a bit more dental development and a bit more maturity. So I decided uh, let's stop, and this was well before um, microosteo perforation. So uh, it was almost like a bit fortuitous that I decided to wait and see if something would come along that would help me. And so we left him alone for a while and just kind of held him, let the rest of the new teeth come in, give his, give his teeth a break, get him back to his dentist and get him all cleaned up. And then uh, we decided that we would go back in once he had all of his permanent teeth and employ microosteal perforation. So uh, there it is. We got the braces on and we've worked up our wires and we're using all of our tricks, including the, uh, the torquing pliers. And um, and then away we go with the microosteal perforation, and we do it uh, in this case both on the palate and on the labial aspect. I mentioned that sort of halo is up to about eight millimeters, but I really wanted to make sure that I got at as many uh, aspects of this tooth root as I possibly could. So we perforate him on both the palate and the labial aspect. And sure enough, along comes his cingulum. So uh, encouraged by this once again. And uh, Ivan uh, is hanging in there, and his parents are happy. And three months later, uh, we're getting to this point. Now, I know that we're not going to get all the way because of that dilaceration. And the last thing I want to do is run that root into the lingual, the uh, lateral incisor. But we wanted to make it the very best we could for Ivan. And um, I absolutely think that that was accomplished. Um, given the, the dilaceration. And so uh, four months up post-MOP, we got to here and I decided that that was, uh, that was pretty well good enough. 
And uh, so we took his braces off. Once again, not the most beautiful case, but we at least got him a central incisor and got it uh, torqued the very best we could. And I honestly believe that uh, a good portion of that was uh, credited to the microosteoperforation. So Ivan's terrible central went from there to there and with microosteoperforation and that's pretty well the best that I could do. Uh, one last one, uh, Charles, 14 year old guy, he's kind of socially active and, and a pretty cool guy and uh, he's out there and he's got a couple of impacted canines and he's kind of going, okay, you know, yes, I'll do this, but uh, by the way, I'm in ninth grade, and uh, uh, we need to we need to move this along, Doc. So, okay, pretty routine. We're going to actually go in and uh, put some braces on Charles, and uh, not too bad. The impactions we certainly seen worse. Um, let's just go ahead and do our routine where we set up the rest of the teeth. He's obviously a bit dentally delayed for the average uh, 14, 15 year old. Um, and those impactions, not too bad, shouldn't be too big a deal. Uh, however, we get into this guy, uh, and a year and two months later, the canine is still not down, and that's despite, uh, you know, our usual routine where we go six months, get the teeth uncovered, uh, you can see the eruption chains are on them, and we're down to the, um, to the springs, and we're using the spring, uh, the open coil spring and the spring and the titanium wire to try and get these teeth to come down and just not happening. And so, uh, and one of them let go too, which, which added to my, uh, to my trouble. So this was the first time that I actually perforated through mucosa where I couldn't, where I actually, actually didn't have an erupted tooth. So uh, this was kind of a new paradigm for me where we were actually uh, dealing with teeth that weren't even through yet and we were using micro perforation. So 18 months I go in there on the palate and I know where the teeth are. Uh, we see it radiographically and also I can palpate them. And I'm going all the way around these crowns of the teeth and we're trying to push it for this guy to get those canines to come through. Because uh, he's starting to talk about you know uh, getting further along in high school and he's pretty, pretty fed up with me. So four months after the mops, uh, here they come. This is that situation where we lost the uh, the one attachment, but actually was able to use my laser and find that tooth and reattach to it. Um, and on the right side, things really came along nicely. So uh, and uh, and 11 months after the microsteel perforations, uh, the teeth were down. So once again, not very fast, but possible. And um, that's kind of the switch for me that has occurred. And uh, so therefore. Uh, pretty excited that it isn't just about speeding things up, it's actually about making really difficult things more possible in my office. And I'm excited about it and I want to continue to learn about it and uh, I think that it'll be going forward, uh, micro perforation and vibration are going to be really neat things to, uh, to help us um, make difficult situations much more possible. So the take homes are that there's many applications of the MOP system and uh, acceleration with microosteoperforation is very routine in my office and uh, high frequency vibration is also showing promise especially for seating aligners and beyond and the next frontier in my opinion is utilizing MOP and vibration to make tough movements less tough and that's what I'm most excited about these days. So I want to thank you for spending this last 54 minutes with me and absolutely open up to questions now. If you can type them in, I can absolutely answer them for you uh, one by one. Uh, first question is from my friend Sunny in, uh, in Edmonton. Hi, Sunny. Uh, your Oilers are uh, very annoying these days, uh, continually beating my Winnipeg Jets. Uh, the code for Propel is actually in the oral surgery part of the uh, FIGAT. And um, we actually, 
I, I don't know the code exactly, but uh, your Propel rep will know it, or your, uh, or just call my office, and my ladies will tell you. Uh, but in in Manitoba, it's uh, per sextant, and I think it's around one hundred and fifty dollars per sextant. And um, we we do indeed. This is a um, MOP is is classified as a medical device, and it is. Uh, it is uh, recognized as such by both the FDA and Health Canada as well. All right, any other questions? Happy to, uh, to field them in the next five minutes or so. I'll hang in there in case there's uh, other things that come to people's minds. I really hope you've enjoyed it and uh, hope it's opening your mind. Okay, Don White, thank you for your um, for your question. The question is, I was wondering if you ever used uh, MOP for uninterrupted second molars. The answer is yes, Don. Similar to that last case I showed you with Charles, we uh, <laughs> you know I seem to get a lot of these where uh, teachers don't come in. And so uh, we know where the teeth are, we've got lots of good imaging and that sort of thing, and they just don't come in. So uh, what we'll do is I will actually uh, go in and uh, micro-osteoperforate as high as I can on these teeth and their roots. And for some reason, it does seem to sort of reactivate the, um, the eruptive process. And I've got a few that I'm watching right now. Somewhere we've used the laser to just um, um, expose their crown so I can actually put something on them and we've micro perforated at the same time and it's showing some promise once again uh, you gotta hang in there Don I um, I don't have the, the long-term uh, results for this but encouraging that we are getting some teeth that are pretty well impossible uh, to start to start coming in uh, Nicholas Frida, thank you for your question. What evidence is there that the VPRO5 works as an aligner seeder? Is it only anecdotal? And the answer is no. That that device is FDA approved as an aligner seeder. So um, th there is evidence, and I can uh, uh, I would ask your Propel rep to uh, send it over to you. But it is actually recognized by the FDA and, and therefore uh, well documented as an aligner seeder. But uh, so far, that's it. And of, of course, um, as you saw. I'm using it a little bit off-label, but uh, um, making sure that I'm clear with, that it is so uh, with our patients when we do that and include it in my uh, informed consent. Um, Sunny, have you used Smile Sonica? I have not. Sunny, I know there's other uh, devices out there. I've been so darn busy trying to get my uh, the VPro5 going in my office that I, that's pretty well the, the only one that I've used. So uh, I will absolutely, you'll have to buy me a drink, but I'll listen to you if you want to tell me about Smile Sonica. Uh, Steven Sachs, thank you for your question. Do you just accept insurance or do you ask for cash? Great one. So Steven, in our office it, it kind of depends. If it's proactive, as in I've thought of it up front and I just say to the patient, look, we're going to need some little dimples around your uh, roots uh, to get things rolling, then uh, we will uh, go ahead and, and uh, put through a fee in our usual way. Usually what it is in my office is we collect it from the patient, give them the, uh, the forms, and then they get reimbursed by their insurance plan. Um, that's, that's kind of the way we work it. Contraindications, thank you also, Stephen Sachs, for that question. Uh, the answer is contraindications to um, MOP that I have discovered have been some that are similar to moving teeth regularly, and those are, are uh, any uh, medication that knocks out osteoclasts, such as bisphosphonates, which are real troublesome these days uh, for a lot of patients that are on um, anti-osteoporosis medications. That's one. I would say anybody who's actually on a lot of anti-inflammatories, it's not going to work well as well, because we actually want inflammation. That's part of the, the game, and that's why we ask our patients to not use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs after this. We actually use stick, stick to Tylenol after, uh, after that. So those, those are the two. Any other sort of anti-inflammation type things that they're doing will probably get in the way of this process. So uh, those are the things that we've seen get in the way. I, I wouldn't use it on a pregnant woman, nor would I use it on a diabetic as well. Uh, Sunny. Uh, once again, thank you for your question. I'm using MOP and TADS to reduce a gummy smile. The case is going well. Have you seen it used for this as well? Uh, Sunny, I have. And we, what we've been doing is 
pretty well at the same time as we install the TADs, I'm, I've got the patient anesthetized. So almost always when I think TAD, I'm also thinking MOP uh, and, and probably IPR as well. So um, absolutely all of those abbreviations go to, towards your success. One thing I have found with that combination is the TADs themselves may loosen more readily. So it may behoove you to choose um, a more um, robust TAD to overcome that. Uh, Stephen Sachs, why the five minute compared to 20, 20 minutes with Excelident? Uh, Stephen, this has come from the frequency and uh, there, there's some really good research that has come out. Uh, our friend uh, Annie Alakani from uh, NYU and other centers have found that uh, five minutes is optimal for the higher frequency. So it's a, uh, Accelident uses a lower frequency and a 20 minute interval. Um, uh, this device, the, v, the VPro5 is using higher frequency and five minutes. And we use it with the aligners in as well, which is a little bit of a difference from Accelident. Can you share a little bit about how you charge for proactive and reactive? And if you do multiple mops, do you charge each time? The same question with vibration. Thanks, Bruce. You hope to come visit soon. Okay, Dan Slutton, you did see the uh, the winter pictures I showed. Yes, uh, but you're always always welcome. Thank you for your for your question. Um, when it's proactive, we we quote a fee. It's usually around five hundred dollars, and that includes in my office most mostly. Uh, both MOP and the vibration. If it's vibration only with an aligner case, generally around $400 extra. And um, if it's reactive, quite often it's me that, that's wanting to do it because I'm aware that I'm in a bind or that uh, I'm aware of the, academic, the uh, economics of actually moving this case along. So in many of those cases, I just kind of throw it in. The MOP costs me around $150 Canadian each. Um, and so I'm willing, if that saves me, you know, like four or five chair visits and also maybe a little bit of my reputation, I'm absolutely willing to, to throw that into the case. So I hope that helps with your case, Dan, uh, with your question and uh, please come visit for sure in the summertime. Uh, Don, uh, Will Height, have you used Accelidane vibrating units and how does the V5 compare to Accelidane? I have used them both, Don, and uh, um, the, the, uh, the, the V Pro 5 I have been favoring because uh, it is the shorter duration. Uh, it's smaller. We, we, one does not require multiple uh, bite planes. Um, with Accelidane, I was finding I had to, to um, have in the inventory a lot of different bite planes depending on the malocclusion. Uh, this one is, is a standard one for all, uh, the five minutes and the less uh, cost uh, and the higher frequency were all uh, compelling to me. Um, and, uh, so th those are the reasons why they, that VPro5 has been at the top of my list. Uh, Don White, yes, uh, we were in Barcelona and it was, it was a pleasure. Uh, you had asked Dr. David Patek, Paquette in Barcelona, what about the options for financing accelerated treatment? And he mentioned that he's used outside financing companies. Is that your experience as well? Great topical question, Don. And uh, we have just fairly recently got into this for uh, overall cases, not just our um, accelerated cases, but it's especially affected with accelerated cases. And, and part of it is it removes the mindset of the money and the medicine as in a lot of these cases are going like twice as fast and all of a sudden you know we, we've got an 18 month payment plan and a nine month uh, treatment. Um, so the, the neat thing about sort of using third party financing is you get all the money up front and therefore uh, it isn't always related to the number of visits or whatever you're doing for the patient. So that's kind of a neat thing and uh, that's why I think that uh, we're motivated to, to use third party financing a little bit more. Uh, another idea that I'd heard with these shortened durations is redefine your retention period as more of an active time as well, meaning that, uh, okay, we're done with the active aligners, but now we're in a holding pattern uh, and the monthly payments continue. So if you're not interested or, or your patients would rather not go for third-party financing, that's another way to disconnect the sort of uh, treatment with the uh, with the, the payment plan, but it is a challenge because now these cases are treating out so much faster. 
Uh, Wade, House Wright, thank you for your question. Any research on increase or decrease of root resorption in high-risk teeth? For example, intrusion of incisors, which tend to be high-risk. Absolutely. Wade, thank you for your question. And we haven't seen it. Uh, and, and I think the reason is, although it's happening faster, uh, or, or as it's happening faster, we're actually getting literal softening of the bone. So and that's how we, we sort of, you know, in layman's terms, when we're explaining to the patient, we say, yeah, we actually, we're actually softening the bone a little bit so that the, uh, the tooth will move more freely through the bone. But that, that is actually fairly accurate. It's not just using vernacular for, for the patient's sake. Uh, and therefore, we've been seeing, although the, the rate of tooth movement is much uh, quicker, we're actually not seeing uh, any extra uh, uh, root resorption uh, in intrusion or any other tooth movement for that matter. And the other side of that is, as you're aware, Wade, one of the big uh, reasons why we're seeing root resorption is staying too long in orthodontic treatment. And so the fact that we're actually speeding up the orthodontics, either with aligners or with braces, um, we're actually seeing uh, about the same amount of root resorption. Uh, Don, one last question. Uh, is the effectiveness the same? So uh, I believe that relates back to your question about Excelident versus the VPRO5. <laughs> um, the evidence for vibration in general in my, uh, in my reading and my uh, analysis of the literature has not been as compelling as microosteoperforation in the area of, of uh, orthodontic acceleration. And I am not convinced that vibration alone is uh, as effective as some had hoped when we began. And uh, um, however, I do believe that the high frequency does make a difference. And also the synergistic effect of microosteoperforation and vibration follow-up is going to be the holy grail. But we got to—I got to be careful to not come out and, and uh, say that uh, too loudly just yet, because I, I don't have the science to back it up. So, uh, but it's showing some promise, and I'm excited about the future. And I hope all of you have considered the last hour valuable. And for goodness sakes, uh, please stay tuned. And got to know that that those of us um, are that are really keyed in on this are going to continue to uh, to work hard to make this a uh, safe and reliable and predictable way not just to accelerate orthodontics but also to get ourselves out of binds. Thank you very much. I hope you all have a lovely evening and uh, get out there and change the world one perforation at a time.